Well, we're starting a new series today, okay? Let me start out this way. When I was 23 years old, I committed my life to Christ. Three days later, I learned a lesson that I hope I never forget. Uh, probably one of the most critical, one of the most important lessons that I learned as a Christian, being a brand new believer, I, want, I really wanted to uh, do my best to uh, really, you know, be good to God, be, be the best uh, example as a believer that I could possibly be. And so, you know, before I would go in, I, I, I would pray in the morning, and, and I remember, I remember even you know, praying one morning, and, and that evening, I was involved in a couple's bowling league. Uh, we had uh, four couples that always showed up for this this league, and uh, you know we were we were friends and, and some office partners and things. And so uh, after the after our bowling was done, we always met in a little restaurant bar at the bowling alley, uh, following our uh, our evening of bowling. So we we'd have a couple of drinks and a dinner, you know. And uh, that evening, when when we finished the league bowling. I, I went with the others as normal to the restaurant and the waitress brought the same as always because she knew us so well. We'd been going there for years and so she just knew what, what we were going to want. And so, um, you know, when she uh, when she came, I, you know, everybody had drinks, not Coca-Cola, okay? And uh, everybody had drinks set in front of them and then she went off to get the orders. Now, I, I didn't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. I didn't want to be, uh, embarrass anyone. And and so when she sat the drink down in front of me, I didn't say anything. Now, I didn't drink much. I just took a little sip as we were waiting for our meal. I will never forget the terrible feeling that came over me. As my friend Rod said, well, Jim, I thought you became a Christian. I remember how I felt. I, I went home. On the way home, I said, God, I shouldn't have done that. God, God, I really, I didn't want to do that, God. God, please forgive me. And I learned one of the most important lessons I think I've ever learned, and that is that Christianity is not attaining perfection. Christianity is a process of living with God. And in that process, there are going to be times we get frustrated. There are going to be times that we fall short. Not only falling short of God's expectations, but there are times when we will fall short of expectations we have even for ourselves. Interestingly enough, you know, I apologize to Rod and his wife and the other couples who were seated with me that evening. They were, and you know how we can, well, no, we don't do it. We don't judge other people, do we? Well, these were some of those people that I thought, you know, God will never reach them. They're too hard-hearted and they'll, you know, uh, they're, they're just, you know, they'll never get there. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I had the opportunity to speak with each one of them. And uh, it's interesting. Years later, uh, you know, Esther and I got married. We, we left and we went to Bible college. And uh, after after I left Oregon, uh, two of these couples committed their lives to Christ and were both serving God in His church. One of them uh, became a youth pastor. And uh, I remember. Both of them called me and thanked me for calling them and asking them for forgiveness after that event. 
But as I look back on this experience from my life, I realized the third day I was a Christian, I wasn't going to be all that I really wanted to be. And wow, you know, Paul just got a hold of my heart in the book of Romans, and it's just a tremendous book. It's a theological book, but Paul, when we get into the book of Romans, he talks about the law, and he, he talks about grace. And uh, he, he talks about the frustration of sometimes the law revealing to him what he was not spiritually. Okay? So let me just give you a little background. If, if you, you can go to this later, just write it down for yourself now if you want to. But in Romans chapter 6, uh, Paul talks there about the power of sin being broken. Verses 2 through 5, he says, God has given us new life. 6 through 11, God has given us a new nature. Verses 12 through 16, God has given us new freedom. That, that's what he talks about in chapter 6. And, and then, then he goes on in Romans 7, and he talks about the fact that we are no longer bound by the law. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But basically, Romans 7 says that God's law reveals sin, but does not have the ability to relieve sin. And there's a difference between seeing our sin because of the law and being able to have some sense of forgiveness from our sin. And, and then he goes on in, in Romans 8, he talks about how God's Spirit frees us from sin. Okay? So Romans 7, and I'm going to begin in Romans 7 and verse 21, and we, we just get a real sense of Paul's frustration. So let me start reading there uh, as Paul is expressing his frustration. He says, I, I find this, uh, this law at work. I want to do good. Evil's right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law in my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in my members. What a wretched man I am. He sends his frustration. <laughs> Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then he says, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Now sometimes, I tell you, some of these deep theological passages of Paul can get you a little, uh, you know how sometimes you get tongue twisted? Well, reading Paul, you get brain twisted. Okay? Yeah. So you get your, your brain wrapped around each side of each other. So, uh, I tell you, you know, I, I found that uh, the Living Bible sometimes helps put a little light on some of these. And so I think I put it in your notes. I don't remember. But if it's not there, here's, here's, how, here's what it says in the Living Bible. It kind of helps me out a little bit. It says, I, it seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what's wrong. And, and uh, I, I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned, but there's something else deep within me in my lower nature that is at war with my mind and wins the fight that makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. He says, in, in my mind, hey, you know, I, I want to be God's willing servant, but instead I find myself still enslaved to sin. So you see how it is? My new life tells me to do right, but the old nature <laughs> that is still inside me, who oh, it loves to sin. Because, oh, man, what a terrible predicament I'm in. Who will free me from my slavery to this deadly lower nature? <coughs> Thank God. Thank God it has been done by Jesus Christ our Lord. He has set me Amen. Amen. It's in your sermon notes there. And I want you to write this down this morning. And so uh, 
Those of you at home who don't have sermon notes, you can still write it down. Get out a piece of paper, write it down. Okay, I want to talk to you about the law. You see, the law, here, here's the thing about the law. The law is perfect. Okay, it, it is perfect. And that's why imperfect man can't keep it. I mean, that's, that's why every time we try to keep the law, we get frustrated. We can never measure up to the law. And, and the law is also, it's holy. And that's why sinners are condemned by it. Every time we look at the law, you see, we see our unholiness. And, and if the law is just, and because the law is just, it, the law can't show grace. The law can't show mercy. It stands on its own. It's just the law. No favors are granted by the law. Now, I want to talk to you about perfectionism this morning. Okay? Uh, I want to talk to you about trying to be a perfect person. I might as well leave now. Gary's <laughs> <laughs> on his way out. <laughs> All right, well, let's just take a quick poll, okay? You at home, you participate, okay? I'm watching you. You, 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 gotta, you gotta participate here. I, I just wanna know this morning, you raised by a show of hands, how many of you know a, a perfect person? Okay, anybody know? Here's the thing. Guys, you really missed out. <laughs> You really missed it. I mean, we're not very smart, are we? <laughs> you see, guys, you can raise your hand and get all kinds of brownie points from your wife, and she'd know you're lying, but she'd love you anyway. <laughs> Just thought I'd point that out, you know? Hey, you could add something there, but oh well. You missed the chance. That, that's all you get. So, now, okay, so none of you raised your hands. Now, how many of you... Let's try this. They've done the raise of hand. Okay, you guys at home, you gotta participate also. How many of you know someone who thinks they're perfect? <laughs> okay, okay, we have a few more there. Okay. So there are some of you, yeah, you know somebody, they, they just they just think they're perfect. Aren't they awful to be around? Well, they're they're just terrible. I mean, you know, they just they because they take their standards of perfection and they try to place them over on you. Yeah. That, that's that's what happens. And you know, you know, you, you walk around as if you're on eggshells around those kind of people. You know, nothing's worse than being around a perfect person. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'd like to tell you that that third day when I sinned and I asked God to forgive me, I'd like to tell you that was the last time I sinned. Well, that's not true. I've sinned one other time since then. <laughs> Well, Esther's here, so if you talk to her and my and the kids, you know, they tell you, well, there, you know, there's an endless list. So anyway, there's no such thing as a perfect person. I, I mean, this whole business of perfectionism. Well, one guy said uh, he was he was married to a perfectionist wife. And he's trying to explain. He said, man, he said. I get up in, in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, and I come back from going to the bathroom and the bed's made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow, you know? He went on to say, she, she's so fussy and didn't want any kind of messes, she put a newspaper under the cuckoo clock. <laughs> so that's just going a little too far, don't you think? You know, yeah. It's a little too far. You know, one time I went by a, a bookstore, I, I was. I was flying somewhere, and it was going to be a little time, you know, it's one of those connections in between planes. Went into the airport bookstore, and there was a book there. And I, I kid you not, the title of that book, it said, The 21 Secrets of Ridding Your Life of Every Evil Habit. Yeah, 21 Secrets of Ridding Your Life of Every Evil Habit. Yeah. And, yeah, I, yeah I didn't buy the book. I don't, I don't think it would have helped me, and, and I don't think it would help you. We're human. And in our humanness, we're going to fall short at times. Now, there's a definition of perfectionism. 
And so I, I want to make sure that you have, have that, okay? Just in case you want to know if you qualify. Uh, it's in your sermon notes. David Burns, he says, it says, perfectionists are those whose standards are high beyond reach or reason. People who strain compulsively and unremittently toward impossible goals and who measure their own worth entirely in means of productivity and accomplishment. For those people, the drive to excel is self-defeating. Wow. There's another person, I, if, you haven't, if you haven't read his books, I, I encourage you to get some. His name is David Siemens. And uh, he has a book called Healing for Damaged Emotions. Uh, I mean, pick it up. I, I don't think anybody does a better job talking about this issue, uh, what I'm talking about, than David Siemens. And in that book, he said that of all the counseling he does, of all the people who walk into his office, he said the number one thing that he deals with more than any other issue it is people who are trying to strive for a certain level of perfectionism that they cannot achieve, and they are just frustrated. So, now you see, it not only works in the secular world, but perfectionism works its way into the church also. And so I want to give you some, this morning I'm just going to talk to you about some of the problems of perfectionism. And uh, the thing is, uh, well, let me just jump into number one here. Okay, if you are a perfectionist spiritually, how do you ever know if you've done enough? Okay? In other words, you're the type of person, you receive your gratification uh, through things that you've accomplished, and you have this, this long list of, of things that you've accomplished. How do you ever know when your list is long enough? Not only how do you know when your list is long enough, but how do you know if you've done what's on the list that you've done it well enough? And so I'm, I'm not only talking about how many things you've done. A perfectionist has a tendency to kind of you know check off check off this this list, and 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 so it's you know how do I know the things that I've done are good enough for me to be accepted? Because you see, self worth for a perfectionist comes through what they do. And, and therefore, it's not only have I done something, but I have done something well enough. And, and what happens spiritually, we begin to make this list of rules. And, and with God, that is dependent on us, you know, uh, okay, I have to jump through these hoops for God. And it's at that moment that instead of having a vibrant relationship, we begin to check off things. And when we're checking off things, we no longer get our joy from Jesus. We get our joy from a check mark on a list. Yeah, I thought I'd have some fun. You know, so uh, I, I was working on this. I, I pulled out an old bulletin that I had saved. Now, Esther and I, when we went to uh, Bible college, uh, we, we attended First Church. It was right there on the campus, right right beside Bible College. And it was, it was a pretty decent-sized church. When we got there, it was about, you know, 400 people. When we left, it just about doubled, I think. I think somebody heard we were living. We were leaving, and so they all came. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you go into the bulletin, that, that bulletin, I should have brought it this one. Uh, the bulletin we had from that church. I mean, when it was, when it was really, you know, it was going, you know, Woody Stevens was a pastor. He just did a great job. So I, I thought, you know, uh, what if I did everything in that bulletin? Okay, and there, there was a lot of stuff. So, so I started looking down. I'm not talking about Sunday school departments. I'm not talking about church services. I'm talking about everything they had going on during the week, the general things of the church. What would happen if some dear person decided that the way they could please God is by doing everything in that bulletin? Well, just, just the reminders in the bulletin I looked at, if you did everything, you'd have 31 things to do that with. Yeah, plus lose your family. But anyway, <laughs> it's just absolutely impossible. All the things that you could have done, you could have done things on Sunday. Now, for some reason, in that particular bulletin, there wasn't anything on Monday. I guess if the pastor didn't show up, 
You know, they weren't going to do anything. So I, I don't know how that worked. But anyway, there was a, you know, I, I appreciate the guys around here. They work on Monday, even though I don't show up. So yeah, good guys. But, it, but anyway, uh, so I, the perfectionist, uh, probably on Monday, then would go to join a parachurch ministry. There were several in Colorado Springs. They get something to do on Monday. But I, I tried to help us understand once if we get into this role of I, the more things I do, the more I please God, it really never ends. I mean, you know what happens? There were 31 things in that bulletin. I could have done all 31 of those things. Let's say, you know, I got home, got the camera around, you know, laid out, laid out my schedule, made sure I did all 31 things that week. I had all kinds of and and I, well, I would, you know, what I do? I'd be looking around at all the 31 things. Well, so and so's not here. I did all 31 things. They only did 29. I'm more spiritual than them. Huh? Yeah. And I and see what happens when you become a perfectionist. I mean, pretty soon, it's not only a factor that affects your own behavior, it begins to impact how you look at other people. And, and you begin to look at them and say, well, I don't think they're as spiritual as I was because they weren't here yesterday and I'm not here. Hello? You know, when I grew up, we had three main services. Okay? We had Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. Wednesday at our church was hit the door and hit the floor. That's what I call the prayer meetings. Okay? They, they, they just came in and boom, you know, they're all right. And uh, so, but but anyway, you know, you know what we used to say? You want to know how popular the church is? See how many people come on Sunday morning. Wow. Yeah. If you want to know how popular the pastor is, we'll see who attends on Sunday night. If you want to know how popular God is, see who shows up on Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, that's what we, I mean, we used to, I, I remember you know, we just thought, well, man, people on Wednesday, they're just a rock of the church, aren't they? You know, they were the faithful. You know, why don't they even come out on Wednesday night? Yeah. But you know, if we were spiritual, back then, did all those 31 things, could I just despiritualize that for a moment? Uh, you know, I just get in a plane then. And if you were the one, you did all 31 things. Yeah, I'd, just, I'd just get you in a plane and we'd go over and see Julie and I'd have you visit Pastor Joe's church. Where you get like a million people who get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and pray for two and a half hours. Okay? Yeah. You know, and you spend two to three hours in prayer. You see, your hamster in a cage, your rat race going on here, perfectionist mindset about God and your relationship with God, kind of based on how many things we do. I mean, that's not healthy. And it really will set you up for disappointment in your walk with God. I need to move on. Second thing. Uh, it only, uh, you know, this perfectionism only lasts as long as your, as your willpower. I think I can get to it. Yeah, there you go. Okay, I mean, let's face it. We're human. We're going to give out sometime. And as, as we go on this level, we're, we're going to have to work real hard, work real hard, work real hard, and, and, and have discipline and, and strength and, and willpower. And, and I suppose, you know, for some people, high energy people, maybe they can just pull it off. But the moment we run out of gas, you see, if your relationship with God is dependent on doing all those things, you run out of gas, you get sick, so all of a sudden, do you realize when you get tired that you have this idea, well, God doesn't love me as much as he did when I wasn't tired? Okay? You get sick, God doesn't love me as much as when I was healthy. Do, do you realize we get worn out somehow, we think that God loves us because of all the things that we do, that all of a sudden our relationship with God begins to weaken? That's not true. That's not true at all. You know, it's it's kind of like going on a diet. 
Some of you probably been there, you know, crash diets, you know how that works. Uh, maybe some of us write a book on it, but you know, dozens of times. I mean, you've lost, you've lost a, you know, 50 pounds or 60 pounds, or you lost your whole self. I lost myself so many times. But you know, yeah, you, 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 you lost yourself so many times, you don't know what's going on, you know. But, but you know what the problem is? I mean, the first thing a person wants to do, they achieve a victory, we want to celebrate. How do we celebrate here? Well, probably one of the best places, Rasmus Robbins or Dairy Queen or something, you know? I mean, that's the place where you go to celebrate, and you're really going to celebrate. So, you know, it's as long as you have this willpower, and then it's just this cycle. And, and what I don't want to have happen is that in the church we get on some kind of a spiritual uh, squirrel cage cycle where we're hot. And boy, we're reading five chapters a day. And man, man, we're praying two or three hours a day. And God bless us. We are such a spiritual church. I just want to get past this whole process of thinking that there's something about God's love for us being attached to doing all this stuff. That's not what the grade is. Do you know... God loves me as much if I don't preach this morning as if I do preach. Do you realize God loves me whether I pastor or don't pastor a church? And it has nothing to do with all the things I do. It's a relationship. It's not the rules. It's not a list of regulations. The only time some people Achieve perfection. I tell you, I, I know this is true. I own my own business for 15 years. The only time some people achieve perfection is on a job application. <laughs> you know, I, I, I used to look at some, you know, when I was in business, I'd think, now there's an employee. That's a perfect employee, you know. God himself would hire this guy. I mean, I think he is God. <laughs> you know? But the, uh, the third problem we have with uh, perfectionism is this. It uh, squeezes the joy out of life. I mean, let's face it. You know, we're, we're human. And, and we're going to give out sometime. As long as we're, we're, we're on, you know, we're going through this, you know, the perfectionism, the all-time joy killers in the Bible, who were they? Yeah, that's right, the Pharisees. They were the all-time joy killers in the Bible. I'm telling you, a group of people who talk about rules and regulations and a list of things to do and not to do, and, and the list, of course, was for everybody else and not necessarily for themselves. Uh -huh. You talk about a group, a somber group of people to be around, uh, you know, living, living, eating people. It was the Pharisees. And, and the problem with their, was their behavior. I mean, they, they did this and, and they didn't do that and... and they, they just lost the joy. I, I like the passage. We're not going to look at it this morning. Maybe I should get but, but anyway, the, uh, John chapter 1, beginning in verse 14. John, you know, John's talking about the, the Word becoming flesh. And it says, we beheld His glory. Wow. And when John is talking about the glory of Jesus Christ, you know what he says we saw? He says, we saw that he was full of grace and truth. Man, that's one, of the, that's one of the highlight phrases of the Bible. I mean, two verses later he said that because we beheld him full of grace and truth, he says, we receive grace upon grace. In other words, Grace just came, and more grace came. And then John said, that, I just think it's so powerful. You see, he's introducing us to Jesus. And he's introducing a new era for the church. And he's distinguishing the difference between Moses and the law and Jesus and grace. Wow. He said for the law, verse 17, John chapter 1. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. Wow. What a revolution Jesus started. No wonder the church had so many questions. 
No wonder it just threw them off when they saw Jesus and his disciples walking through the cornfield and picking some kernels of corn or wheat or whatever. And then so while the disciples were picking food, they started picking through the commandments. Why did you do that? They found out real quickly Jesus wasn't a rule keeper. No wonder it liberated so many people. No wonder there was such freedom and such joy around Jesus. I mean, that heavy load of the law was lifted off of them. And, and Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. No wonder they loved the words of Jesus when he said he was truth and his truth would set them free. What a breath of fresh air. I mean, I, I read a true story about a father. He was a quite pharisaical and, and uh, legalistic. He had a little girl. Her name was Jenny. He was, only, he was against everything. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. And he was one of those that, you know, we don't, we don't do people. In fact, his expression was, he, he would look at his little girl and he said, we don't believe in that, do we? We don't believe in that, do we? And so the little girls are growing up, you know, well, we don't believe in anything, you know. And, and one day they're walking by a pond, and there's this mother duck. And the mother duck has some little fuzzy babies. Follow the mother duck. And, and little Jenny, you know, she runs over there, and she's able to, you know, just pet some little, little ducklings. And, and uh, she's just having a good time, and she's smiling, she's enjoying it. And she turns to her father and remembers his expression. She heard it so many times, and she said, Daddy, we do believe in ducks, don't we? <laughs> yeah. I've known a lot of Christians. No joy. No joy in their lives. Totally squeezed out. And you said, well, well maybe they weren't. Why, why, why did they lose that joy? Well, I can tell you why they lost that joy. All of a sudden, their relationship with God became a list of do's and don'ts. And, and all of a sudden, they were, you know, they had to make sure they read their five chapters a day. They had to make sure they got in their hour of prayer a day. And, and they only read four chapters. Something must be wrong. And certainly, you know, they must have had a problem here in their life or something because they didn't read that fifth chapter. And it was just, it's constant. Then check, 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 check. You know, they're just all bound up in that. Just bound up. And the fourth thing I see is that perfectionism just hinders relationships. I mean, when I, saw, when, when I say perfectionism hinders relationship, you know what? Perfectionism hinders our relationship with God and, and, and with other people. But, but let me talk about God first, you know? In fact, you know what? If your life is a bunch of legalistic do's and don'ts, if that's your life, after a while, I mean, you can get this Christianity business down you don't even need God. I mean, just, you know, just follow the list. Juan Corley, Carlos Ortiz said it better probably than anybody else. He, he talked about, you know, the law and, and how, it, how, how that impacted us and how it killed. And he said, well, let's suppose, you know, you're a Christian, you're a praying person. You get up one morning, you pray, and you hear God says, says to you, hey, eat an orange this morning. And so you do. And so the next morning you get up and God says, eat an orange. And so you do. And the next morning you get up and God says, eat an orange. And so you do. And so the next morning you just get up and eat an orange. You know, and, but, but, but you get up, you, you pray on Thursday, and God says, eat an apple. And you go, ooh, man, that must not be God's voice. You see, where our relationship is hurt is when we get a bunch of rules and regulations that we unconsciously begin to block what God has new and fresh for us. And, and, and we just always have to do it the same way every time or it's not godly. There's no room for creativity. No room for new thought. No room for a fresh breath of air spiritually to come into our lives. I tell you what, you want to get squeezed out of that mold? There's <coughs> people that can do that. <coughs> We've had to figure out some new things, haven't we? We've never done it this way before. Yeah. I, I know people, they're like that doctrinally, you know? I know people, they have their doctrine, you know, I'm absolutely correct, this is right, everybody else is wrong. And 
you know, they they go to they go to God's word and get blind in it. And they don't realize that God's word is alive and active and, and it says different things to different people. And and you know, God wanted to do some things. Who did he do those things through? He did them through people who were receptive to his truth. Receptive to what God was doing at that time in their lives. Perfectionism. It will hinder your relationship with God. And perfectionism, you know what? It will hinder your relationship with other people. Uh, nothing is worse than a legalist. I just love the definition of a legalist. I, I put in your sermon notes because I thought you might want to show that to some of your legalist friends. Uh, a legalist is someone who insists on letting their conscience be your debt. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's, that's a legal. I don't know if you know anybody like that. You know, I've got a couple like that. You know what I found out about legalistic people? They're intolerant of failure in others. Okay? And, and in fact, you know what I've noticed about them? I, I noticed they put a very high level of whatever they want on everyone else. Now, here's probably maybe the most important thing I want to say in the message this morning. I want you to listen carefully. Uh, here's what happens. They not only put a high level of expectation on other people, but here's the danger. Watch carefully. When you and I have a high level of expected performance on ourselves, and we cannot perform at that level, you know, we've set a level for ourselves, but we can't achieve that, because sooner or later, that happens. Okay? And what happens most of the time is it forces us to begin to act like we're doing something we're not doing. Okay. Follow along with me here. It forces us into pretending that we did what we, the goal we set, and it forces us into hypocrisy. <laughs> and pretty soon, we're not real. We begin to put on a face, we begin to put on a facade, and, and we begin to cover up, and we begin to act like we are something that we are not, and we begin doing things that we are not, and so we, 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 we try to make up the difference with where we are on our process of reaching perfection by saying things we shouldn't say and doing things we shouldn't do, and pretty soon we begin to play this game with our lives that makes me absolutely sick when Christians do it because there is nothing worse for the witness of Jesus Christ in this world than a plastic Christian. It's like everything is fine. There are no problems in my life. Life's just a fluff ball. Isn't God good? Yeah, it's good just got to maybe make you rich too. <coughs> and we cease to be real. We cease to be transparent. We cease to be vulnerable. Now, what happens to us when we cease to be all those things? You see, God comes to an honest heart. God comes to a transparent heart. God comes to a broken heart. So what happens is the, the minute we start to put up this, this false picture of ourselves, the moment we do that, God cannot come and do a work in my life or your life because we have our defenses up and God can't, well, he won't penetrate those defenses. Because we won't even be real with ourselves. So we can't even come to grips with who we are. I mean, we I, I can't repent if I'm not honest about where I'm living and what's going on. If I'm living this lie, I can't repent because I'm not telling myself the truth. <clears throat> it's a vicious, vicious cycle. And, and Christians ought to be the most real people on earth. Sadly, in some circles, I find Christians to be the most plastic people on earth. Now, another thing about perfectionism is it will stunt your growth. Okay? Remember when they used to say coffee would stunt your growth? 
Yeah, I was recruited by the NBA when I was five. But uh, <laughs> perfectionism will stunt your growth. Okay, not only that, I just want to say this in passing. Perfection, perfectionism will stunt your professional growth. Perfectionism will stunt your income growth. There was a survey done recently that showed that perfectionism in people uh, caused them to earn an average of $15,000 a year less than non-perfectionists because they would lose their priorities after a while and spend an inordinate amount of time on things that would bring no return to them. I believe that. Yeah, but I, I, what I'm talking about spiritually, studying our spiritual growth, you see, God is interested in bringing, you know, and us being in process, not perfect. But he's, he's wanting us to go through a process in our lives and people who are process oriented, they, they make all kinds of attempts. They'll try. People who are perfection oriented, they won't make attempts because they don't want to do it if they can't do it exactly right. So the Bible says I ought to do this, I ought to do that, you know, but, but I don't think I can. And so they'll, they'll study it a little bit more, and we'll study more, and we'll study more about it, and spend more time. And basically, no application in the life because it is never going to be good enough. It is never going to be right, and so they just stay away from it. And God wants you and me, he wants us to attempt. It's in our attempts that we grow. It's, it's in our trying that we grow. And, and you see, we want to have trophies, and God just wants us to try. It's through the trying, it's through that experience that we begin to grow in him. Perfectionists, they want to change everything around. They, they want to be perfect before they do it. And God doesn't want you to change things around in your life, folks. God wants to change you. He wants to change me. You see? And so, that's what he wants to change. But, you know, perfectionism also can harm the church. When I say can harm the church, I challenge you today. Just do a little study of God's word and study what God wants the church to be like. You do a little study, you'll see in Scripture God wants you that God wants you to produce not it's not about some perfect community. You know what I sense? What I sense is that God wants you to uh, wants us to become a people of forgiveness and love and compassion and mercy and character development. All of those things. I mean, where do we get our character? Where where do we get all these things that God wants us to become? in our lives. I mean, where do we get them? We get them through trial and error, through failures and mistakes, forgiveness. It's a process. I mean, as I look at that, I see I see perfectionists. You know, there are two words you always hear from people who are perfectionists. And uh, I heard Dr. Wiseman in the Bible college. He said, try to stay away from these two words as much as you can. And he wrote them big and chalked up on the board. Ought and should. Ought and should. They're big words with perfectionists. They're judgmental also. They're critical. You want, you want to know something about perfectionists? I'll tell you something interesting about perfectionists. They cannot establish and keep long-term relationships. You know why? Because nobody ever measures up. They never make yeah. And nobody, nobody ever measures up to their, you know, their, their chart. They'll start a relationship. Pretty soon that person is as good as they thought they were going to be. They'll go to church, and pretty soon that church isn't everything they thought it was going to be. And, and then they'll go from church to church to church just because they can never find a church that measures up. Well, the Sunday school teaching, it just wasn't any good. The preaching, well, you could have done a lot better, you know. Well, that youth group, well, they didn't even have one. They're, they're always, you know, I can tell you, they just sit there and they just they just measure it off. And, and well, so there is nothing more arrogant than a perfectionist attitude about people, and especially if you have that attitude about your brother and sister in Christ. If you, if you have that attitude about your friends in the church, wow. It'll make you, it'll give you a critical spirit. It'll make your attitude become bitter. It'll cause you to live a life of hypocrisy and lies yourself because you'll have a standard that not only others can't attain, but which you yourself cannot attain. 
And, and you'll say to yourself, well, why can't I see this, uh, establish a uh, deep, uh, uh, long-term relationship? Well, the answer is really easy. Could be summed up in one word. You haven't understood grace. You see, grace and forgiveness and the fact that it's a human world and human things happen in a human world and the things don't always come out like we want them to come out. Okay? Let me get a move on here. Perfectionism also takes uh, focus off of Christ and off of Calvary. You show me a person who is into perfectionism, accomplishment, achievement, and I'll show you a person that will focus on perfection instead of focusing on the cross. I mean, look at the difference. I, I put it in your sermon notes because I, I really wanted you to have it. And, and when I focus on perfection, you see, then it's my goodness, my achievement. I, you know, I'm worthy. You know, and, I get, and, and, and it causes, you know, I, I feel worthiness. And, and then the, the result is that I have pride. But you see, when I, when I focus on the cross, there's a different thing. It's God's grace. It's God's achievement. I feel thankful. And the result is humility. There's a huge difference. A lot of difference. And, and you say, well, Pastor, but well, why, why strive for perfection? Well, first, yeah, several reasons. I just going to give you three because I ran too long already. But it, if we find our self worth in striving for perfection, many people have so low, such low self esteem that this list and work oriented, they say, if I could just do this. I feel better about myself. And then there's an eagerness to please others. Uh, we grew up in our life, we did certain things, you know, I pleased other people, and our parents said, hey, if you didn't do these things, I'm not happy with you. And that carries over into the spiritual dimension, and so a lot of times we become easier, eager to please. And we just want to jump through hoops just to, just to get past that. And then, you know, we lack an understanding of God's grace. If you're, if you're trying to be a professional, you lack an understanding of God's grace. And, and so, I just want to wrap it up quickly, helping us to understand the grace of God. And, and I don't think I have a full answer here, but I have three simple words of phrases that I hope will help you begin to understand God's grace as we go on today. Okay? The first thing I'd encourage you is, if you want to understand God's grace, first of all, just obey God. Uh, I mean, just a matter of fact, you know what I want you to do? Don't focus on perfection, just focus on obedience. Just focus, just, just obey God. And I remember when Jesus called his disciples, remember what he said? He said, if you'll follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, he said, just obey me, just follow me, and, and I'll make you what you need to be. You see, perfectionists, we kind of think they can make themselves what they need to be. So we strive. Jesus said, no, you just follow me. And the ones he picked, I mean, they were so far from being perfect. Wow. You know, it's interesting, after three years, uh, with them, they were still a long ways from perfection. After Jesus was with them three years and with their following, he said, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, and so, you know, you don't need to do it yourself. Let Jesus do it. Second thing I'd encourage you is just, just get to know God. Okay? That one. Just, just get to know God. I got it there somewhere. There we go. Okay. Uh, get to know Him in a personal way. Uh, some of you have probably read the book, you know, Knowing God, a popular book. If you haven't, uh, written by Packer, uh, I encourage you, you know, it's a good book. But uh, in Jeremiah chapter 9, I'm just going to read this to you. It says, uh, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, in other words, he said, I want to boast. Let me tell you what to boast about. Let him boast about this, that he understands and knows me. Just, just get to know God. And, and then, you know, the other thing is just to trust God. Trust him. I think sometimes we believe God cannot do something unless we help him out. Okay? And, and I just want you to learn to trust him. God loves me. And, and, and God wants me. But God's kingdom is not dependent on me. And God's kingdom is not dependent on you. God is God. Remember this, and I close here, remember the beautiful story of, of Peter and John. John tells us in, in John chapter 21, Jesus came back to Peter there, 
And, and here's Peter. He's denied the Lord. He, he missed all kinds of spiritual lessons in his life. He's, you know, Peter's had kind of an unteachable spirit. Jesus would say things to Peter, and Peter would disagree with Jesus. I mean, and Jesus looked at Peter, and Jesus said, hey, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And I think it's probably one of the greatest lessons I learned out of John chapter 1, the fact that Jesus was willing to take any person, even Peter, who had had just incredible failures in his life, and literally hand Peter the keys to the church. I'm telling you right now, a perfectionist wouldn't have given Peter the keys. <laughs> no. I'm so glad that the standard God puts on us is totally different than the standard we sometimes have for one another. It was, if God was willing, was wanting perfection, he would have never given the keys to Peter. He would have found somebody else. In fact, he'd probably taken a look at all those 12 disciples and say, God, I need another three years. I'm going to call a different 12. Well, boys, it's been three years. <laughs> no. You know what he did? He said, Pete, here are the keys. Build my church. Wow. You know what? There are people attending church today who, if Pete came around, wouldn't even let him on the property. I like when I put at the end of your sermon there and just wrote it out and, and I, I wanted you to have that there said this when we experience God's grace when I struggle if I really understand God's grace when I struggle I seek God's advice when I fail I seek God's forgiveness when things look hopeless, I seek God's timing. When I'm blessed, I praise God's goodness. When I'm exhausted, I rely on God's power. Notice these next words, please. I can be vulnerable. I can be vulnerable. I can admit weakness. You know what, folks? I don't have to pretend. I don't have to pretend. The next several weeks, we're going to talk about what this means. What it means to understand the grace of God. The incredible gift He's given us in our lives. You know what? I hope by the time we get done with this series that you will understand. You don't have to pretend. Praise God. I am who he says I am. Lord, thank you for your grace poured out of our lives. Lord, I know that there, there may be a, a lot of different emotional buttons and, and pressure points and things like that that we we've touched upon today. And maybe some places that might have even hurt a little bit. And maybe just some places where there's a challenge to go. But God, your word is always challenging us. And you're always bringing, bringing up things where we can we can uh, take another step up, up that ladder and, and, uh, and exert that other spiritual muscle so that, so that you will help us, Lord, to... Uh, be the people that you created us to be. And Lord, it's not by our strength, it's not by our power, it's by yours that we can live this life. And so Lord, I thank you for um, for those on, in our, our home and those that are here, that we have such a wonderful people who are so willing to listen to your word and apply it to their lives and to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for coming and changing my life and giving me the opportunity to grow in you. 
Because, Lord, when we start and stop growing, we are dying. And none of us want to die spiritually. So, Lord, will your people enter our lives, change us at your speed, and may we learn to apply your grace, not only to ourselves, but to everyone with whom we come in.